have a chat with Eric from the Atlantean Conspiracy dot com. Uh, Eric and I have known of each other's work and had the odd chat over the years. Then, then a few months ago, I saw he'd written a book about the flat Earth model. I was, I was embarrassed for him and got in touch with him to see if he was okay, if he was joking, gone crazy, or whether some psyops had got to him. And we had a kind of rational chat, and he sent me his book on the flat earth and told me to have a look. Now, after some sniggering and laughter, I, I read it and thought, hey, this is fun, I can debunk it in an evening or so. So I quite like researching and stuff. Now, 300, 400 hours later, after I did some deep investigation, research, and reviewing... All I, all I could really debunk was the NASA, physics, heliocentric, relativity, spin around the sun model, and very much agree with, lean towards the, the flat earth model. Since then, Eric's made a lot of YouTube movies that have gone viral, had a lot of, uh, a lot of people commenting on his website and on his Facebook, and Eric's done very well debunking them and rebuffing a lot of scientists the ooh I'm intelligent scientist male gangs and this is kind of snowballing so much so that some people in the I hate these words truth movement alternative websites whatever labels you want to use some people are starting to do shows and articles with a lot of disdain towards anyone aligning or leaning towards the flat earth model so I think, I think it's about time someone had a chat to Eric and someone had, you know, some people got some of this information out. Because it's not just the Earth's flat, there's a lot of sub-subjects. So if you're new to this information, you're obviously laughing, it's all kind of funny, <laughs> fall off the edge, ha ha. But know this, for, for every answer you get, you're just going to spawn loads more questions. Because there are so many stones to unturn. So... Without putting lots of time in, it's just going to look laughable. There's no other way around it. There's no, no one's going to tell you the Earth's flat. There's loads and loads of things one needs to look at to make this model look slightly palatable. So, without further ado, let's welcome Eric. If you could uh, lightly introduce yourself, your website, and a little bit about your journey through creating your Flat Earth Conspiracy book. Hey, good to finally talk with you, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I started my AtlanteanConspiracy.com website like eight years ago when I was getting into 9-11 truth and uh, those New World Order, those kind of conspiracy topics that Alex Jones and David Icke always went on about. So they kind of got me into the whole conspiracy world. And then as I got into it further, they went from uh, heroes to anti-heroes for me. Yeah. And now I see them as cold opposition, kind of working for the man in one way or the other. Um, and so I, as far as the flat earth is concerned, I'd always had uh, some notes regarding the, the spinning ball earth as they taught us in school. Uh, I remember as a kid, they, they you know, raised in my hand and asking questions of the ball with it spinning around, why doesn't everything fly off or fall off, and they'd explain gravity, and that, that just wasn't doing it for me, it didn't make much sense, but the way school is, is you got to regurgitate their answers or else you fail, and you yeah. gotta keep until you do regurgitate their answers. So, all right, okay, whatever. It's a spitting ball. Gravity, got it. Okay, yeah. I can put that down on a test. True, false, true. Whatever you say. It and uh, that's why I was school, always uh, at school. The things that go in between the age of seven and twelve seem to go in re really deep. That's what I oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they, you get to them young, and you can keep them for life, right? Yeah, and how did the actual book come about, Eric? What what sort of information, what sort of things happened to in enable you to think, wow, I'm going to collate all this and write a book about it? Uh, I started looking more into geocentricity, which is the idea that the Earth is stationary and the planet stars and the moon all revolve around us. And there's quite a lot of evidence there, so I deepened my Atlantean Conspiracy book 
Uh, I didn't get into the flat earth, though I had already started reading a bit of old flat earth material at the time. And over the, the past few years, uh, I've been reading a lot more. And once I'd read enough to be convinced of the conspiracy and have enough evidence to present my own arguments and represent the, the old arguments, uh, that's when I wrote my book. Yeah, great. Because as, as I said in the introduction, uh, I read your book and I was sort of laughing a little and tried to debunk it. And after three, four hundred hours research, I'm on board and with the flat earth model. And it's quite simple-ish to debunk the heliocentric spherical earth model. And that's what I sort of want to go into today. I want us to, instead of saying, oh, we think the earth's flat, people will just turn off laughing. Is actually look at all these little stones that one needs to unturn to sort of get towards, leaning towards some sort of questions towards it possibly being a flat earth. Because as you know and I know, it, it, there really is hundreds of hours research before you even start to really question it. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> to, to really be convinced of the, the evidence and the proofs for a flat earth and to debunk all of the supposed proofs and evidence you think you have for the spinning ball earth, you're going to have to put in some serious time researching these things yeah. so you can figure it out for you. Yeah, I mean, what I will say is that it's the spherical earth, heliocentric is a model, and it is a model that works. That doesn't mean it's true. You know, people can go sure. and study it, astrophysics it work for very well. 10 years and be a great astrophysicist, but they're learning a model, they're learning a theory. It, it doesn't mean it's true, just because it's in university. Uh, should we, I think we should start off maybe, Eric. I mean, this will turn get loads more people to turn off straight away, but I'm not too fussed about those people who aren't open to new information. Um, the actual model we're talking about here when we say flat earth, I mean, people automatically think, oh, well, you're going to fall off the edge, and, well, people have sailed and flown around the world. I think we should just maybe talk about the model. I mean, we, we, I think we both agree the North Pole's in the middle. There's a round, flat disk with Antarctica all around the outside. Is that something you agree with, Eric? Yep, that's the model. Yeah, so of course, poss of course people can't fall off the Earth because they hit Antarctica. And of course people can sail or fly around the Earth because they go around Europe, Africa, the Americas, around Australia, and back to where they started on this round disc, this circle. Now, obviously this is a bit of a long jump to get from a heliocentric school lesson to this model we're talking about. So maybe we could start with... a. Maybe if you could explain a few things on why we're not spinning and why we're not spinning around the sun. we sort of tear apart the heliocentric model a little bit. Sure. So the, the model that we're taught is not only are we spinning, the Earth is supposedly a ball that's spinning on its axis at over a thousand miles per hour, but it's also spiraling, uh, uh, spinning around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour, while the sun is spinning around the Milky Way galaxy at uh, 600,000 miles per hour, and the Milky Way galaxy is shooting off from a Big Bang uh, creationary explosion 14 billion years ago at something like 670 million miles per hour. Yeah, that's a lot of that's something like that. That's a lot, that's a lot, but the magic of gravity and uh, science allows that to not be felt, seen, or heard by us in any way, so that, you know, this supposed thousand mile per hour eastward spin, uh, you can feel the slightest westward breeze, yeah. but not, not nothing from this uh, spin, and that, of course, the heliocentrists tell us, is because uh, the atmosphere magically sticks to the spinning ball yeah. Earth. Which is strange because with then it. the air one mile up would be traveling slower than the air, you know, 50 miles up because there's further for it to go. I've spoken to some scientists about this and they've been put in a corner and had some very strange replies. Uh, we can also look yeah, at the Red Bull skydive a few years ago. He went into outer space, uh, wow. it took him three hours to go up and then land. Obviously, if the Earth was spinning, he should have landed hundreds of miles away from where he took off. But he actually landed six, seven miles away from where he took off. This doesn't make sense. 
Right, right. Like you said, the higher up the atmosphere would go, it would have to be spinning faster because it's further away from the center of spin. And no one can explain this. Right. And they don't say how high up it goes. They they don't tell you how high up the vacuum of space begins either. So apparently gravity and the atmosphere and everything has this effect and it's spinning gradually faster and faster the higher you go. So if you were sending a rocket up there, the rocket would be going through faster and faster layers of spinning atmosphere until eventually somehow it out, out into non, non-spinning atmosphere? Yeah, I've been speaking what? to people about this, some scientists, and I've said, okay then, where is this, how many miles up does this spinning fast atmosphere stop? Is it 100 miles, 120 miles, 200 miles? All these scientists say, I don't know. Like, <laughs> well, you, you sort of should fucking know. You've done 10 years right. of science, you think you're clever, and you don't know this? And, and how can a vacuum of space exist adjacent to and not separate in any way from the non-vacuum of the atmosphere of the well, Earth and all these other planets that supposedly exist? Exactly. It's not possible. It's not possible. Uh, this is just what, what I'm going to do with Eric to the listeners. I just want to have a brief chat on all these little stones that will be here for 10, 20 hours. So if you're interested in the heliocentric model and its flaws and its problems, uh, have a look at Eric's website, theatlanticconspiracy.com, or I've got a few articles on this at wakeywakey.com. Uh, what I want to do now is move on to curvature. Now, obviously, if we live on a ball, I would sort of want it to act like a ball. And I've been doing some research and a lot of the stuff you've done, Eric, I've looked at, and it seems that if someone goes very high up in a hot air balloon, well, this is horizon, but with, with curvature, there isn't really any curvature. I mean, you go to the beach, you can't see it. It looks flat. Granted, people say, well, I can only see 50, 60 miles. The curvature is so slight, I cannot see it. Would you like to talk a little bit about curvature, Eric, and the flaws yeah, within this? You, you can't see it, and you can't measure it. So like you said, uh, yeah, it's there, man. It's there. You just can't see it or measure it anywhere, yeah. ever. Uh, but uh, so you can see for yourself that the horizon is always flat and it rises to your eye level no matter whether you're underwater or 20 miles up in the atmosphere the horizon is going to be coming right up with you all the way up if you isn't it and it's always flat all the way around now if you are on a ball no matter how big as you rose up the horizon would stay exactly where it was yeah. and you'd have to look down more and more the higher you rose to be looking at the horizon at all. Uh, so the fact that you can see the horizon from 30,000 feet in an airplane at all proves, proves that not the Earth is flat. Yeah. <laughs> proves it's not at all. People think they see a little bit of curve because there's like a, a curve in the, the glass, a slight curve, and yeah. their uh, confirmation bias mixed with that and all the other, uh, you know, pictures we've seen uh, with fish eye lenses fish eye and lenses whatever. Fish eye lenses are used very much. I mean, on the Red Bull, the Red Bull jump from outer space, or very near space as they called it, the, the horizon was curving, it was going flat, it was going concave, convex. I mean, it was extremely crazy. But when you look at right. amateurs sending with their child maybe a rocket up, you know, 30 miles, 20 miles, and recording it, when I look at this footage, I see, I see flat, and I see a, a horizon that keeps rising with the camera. It doesn't make exactly. sense. Now, I don't mind if it's a ball. I, I don't need some crazy beliefs, belief system. I don't need to go with the underdog or be a conspiracy theorist. I just want a ball to act like a ball. Because if it doesn't, it's not a ball. It's as simple as that. If it is a ball, you can measure the ball too. And they tell us the ball is 25,000 miles in circumference. And so you use spherical trigonometry to figure it out. It gets to 8 inches per mile, varying inversely with the square. So it's It's 8 inches the first mile. Yeah, 32 inches the next mile, 72, yeah. keeps going I so that you can maintain that curve. I who was attacking me, he said it's 8 inches a mile, full stop. And I said, <laughs> I mean, can you imagine what that, that would be? Because yeah. It would just be a descending, slanted line, a straight a line tilting down. So he was talking no, it about wouldn't be some a, sort of pyramid. Well, it would be a he, had, he had some sort of pyramid <laughs> going on in his head, yeah. and he didn't yeah. even know it. 
<laughs> I mean, these, these people who are thinking they're clever, I'm coming across a lot of logic-minded, atheistic males in their 30s and 40s who align with things that make them feel clever to give them definition. And I've put a few of these people in a corner, and they get very frazzled very quickly. Have you had a similar experience, Eric? Uh, uh, refraction, <laughs> frames of reference, inertia, uh, relativity, relativity, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I said, well, why is the moon not falling into the Earth? They said it is. It's just going to take 10 trillion, zillion, gillion years. <laughs> 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 no, that's why evolution works, because it's 14 billion years ago. Every, anything works if you put a big enough timeline, right, right atheists? Of course, because you, your grandchildren <laughs> are going to be dead before anything, you know, or your grand... There's no, there's no... It's too big, you know? So, one of some of the main things I'd say to listeners is have a look at... Uh, have a look at curvature, have a look at horizon. Because obviously if you go up in a hot air balloon, you're on a ball, the horizon should fall down. And it stays at eye level. This isn't the behaviour of a ball. It's as simple as that. Uh, also, with the ball thing, you wrote an article, Eric, about. Uh, I mean, there are there are millions, billions of people on this planet that believe the Pacific Ocean is like, you know, like half of a ball. They believe water curves at its surface. <laughs> exactly. Just had me laughing and smiling for many days. I mean. Because we can't replicate this, this can't be measured in any other way, but these people believe the Pacific Ocean is, is like a ball. Would you like to do some comedy, sorry, talk about this? <laughs> so if you're standing on the beach and on a clear day you can see three miles to the horizon, then that means that the water is actually rising up six feet from the horizon to your feet as it washes up on the shore. That's what you're believing um, without measuring first uh, to see if that's actually what's going on. And if you do measure it, you'll see that that's not what's going on and that water is always level. And we know this from physics. It's, it's the natural physics of water to always find and remain level. Yeah. If you dam up some water and you release the dam, the water will spread out in all directions and find the easiest course to maintain its level yeah. once again, it and then it will remain to still. The center of a ball, gravity, illusory, invisible force. Say, I'm stopping here. I'm just going to try and get to the center of the Earth. Water doesn't move right. like anywhere. No, no, they can't give you any example of water behaving that way. They can't create some sort of gravitized ball to do that. They can't even make some sort of gravitized thing in the first place because gravity doesn't exist whatsoever. Yeah. They have no example uh, on a scale smaller than the Earth, apparently, or the Moon, uh, of something that has enough gravity to have some effect on something. So they claim that gravity is such that it is just a force by uh, masses by virtue of their large mass alone, cause smaller masses to either stick to or orbit them, depending on what they want at the moment, what's convenient. So, for instance, uh, they, they want humans to stick to the ball Earth. So, in that case, the magic force of gravity uh, pulls us to the center of the ball and keeps us stuck here. Um, but the moon, and, and they, they want the moon to be uh, in Earth's orbit, and so what gravity does there is it allows the moon to just orbit around it. And I've, I've said before, this is paradoxical, because in this case, either you should be able to jump up and start orbiting around the or Earth, or the moon should just be sucked into the Earth like we are, supposedly. Same reason we don't fall off the, yeah, the ball. So how, how does gravity have all of these multifaceted uh, magical properties that can't be reproduced in, in any experiments whatsoever? But people parrot this like, like it's you know, been proven for centuries that gravity is this, this force that holds us on the Earth yeah, it's and just keeps weight, us isn't it? spinning I mean, around I believe the in weight, but no one's actually explained gravity to me well enough. And I think Newton didn't even finish his theory, did he? <laughs> I think the apple hit him on the head and he just forgot he everything else. He just ate it and just like sold some books and chilled out somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Most likely. <laughs> um, these are very... The sun and the moon are very deep subjects. I mean, these two subjects really got me... They got me stumped for weeks. I had so many questions. I'm still researching some things about the moon. But very briefly, I mean, they... Most people believe the sun's 93 million miles away <laughs> and the, the eclipse where the sun and the moon are the same size is a, is a random coincidence. 
Now, I think we both agree the sun and the moon are above the flat earth, spinning round. The sun goes in like a spiral, which gives us the seasons. Would you like to elaborate a little bit more on the, the sun and the moon, Eric, from the theories within your book? Right. So they said the sun is 93 million miles away, um, and the moon is, uh, whatever, it's like 400 times closer. Is that what it is? So it's 400 times closer, but 400 times smaller. So it just happens to look from our perspective that they're exactly the same size. Um, yeah, that's one of many coincidences in heliocentric models. Um, in actuality, though, we can see with our eyes and measure with sextants that they are the same size, about 32 miles in diameter. And they rotate over and around the flat Earth, as you said, in a spiral pattern, circular spiral pattern, like the yin-yang yes. symbol with the, yeah, with the um, white and dark areas and then the circle in the middle of the little spiral thing and then if you have the yin yang spiraling eastward all the time you've, you've got yourself a little sun moon over the flat earth model right there um, and they do uh, change their orbits a little bit as you said causing the seasons the sun starts uh, like December 25th say the just after the winter solstice starts going uh, very fast and close, uh, starts at the Tropic of Capricorn and works its way to the equator three months later at the uh, equinox and then another three months works its way into the Tropic of Cancer and it's slowing down all the time as it does to so that it, uh, the time remains the same the 24 hours remains the same but the um, distance traveled is changing yeah. every day as it makes a smaller and smaller pattern and then for, for the next six months it's the opposite as it gets bigger and bigger uh, going back to the from the Tropic of Cancer to the Tropic of Capricorn yeah that's why you've got the different lengths of days and everything yeah. uh, in different areas at different times of the year I don't want year. to bring up the dome word yet we're far too early in our chat for the dome words but do you see the sun as being how far away do you see it as being all the flat earth material I've seen has it within 3,000 yeah. miles or, or, or closer uh, some say as close as like 700 miles. Uh, there's slight discrepancies there, but nothing like the discrepancies in the heliocentric yes. model, which range Millions. from three, yeah, three million miles was the first estimate by Copernicus 500 years ago, and then it was up to 12 million miles 100 yeah. years later with Kepler, and it just kept getting bigger and bigger until today, where we're at 93 million I would, miles. I would urge listeners so, to look at the size of the sun compared to the Earth in the mainstream model and then go and watch a sunrise or a sunset and just have a really deep think about what's happening because it's just not possible have a look at the sun's rays coming through the clouds have a look at some homemade uh, sort of high altitude rockets filming the sun from like 20 miles up this thing is not 93 miles away it just isn't I mean it, you don't even need to no. do too much research you just need to meditate and look look and just use your eyes i mean really this this is a big lie I, the sun's quite an easy one to knock off the list i think yeah there's amateur balloon footage um you know when you're up about 20 miles over the clouds you can see that the sun is quite close and there's even physical proof of it like with the hot spots you can see on the clouds underneath the sun uh, like a spotlight it's shining light directly on the clouds underneath it and not on the clouds anywhere else yeah. around it so there's examples like that where you can see uh, em empirically with your eyes that the sun cannot be 93 million miles away you just look at any uh, sun photos as it's shining through the clouds you'll notice that the sun's rays are not coming in at all yeah. the same angle uh, and they come in at at a, at a, a variance of angles that points up towards exactly yeah. where if the sun would be. If it was 93 million miles away and much, much bigger than us, it would just be one angle, bosh. You know? Sure. Even with the, what are they called, crespuscular rays or some shit, they've got, they've got scientific names for yeah, their bullshit. Yeah, refraction. I've been so to a scientist, you, you know it's refraction, oh, yeah. it's refraction. I'm like, yeah. yeah. You don't know about the crespuscular <laughs> waves. You know? These crespuscular <laughs> rays, what they do is they magically make it 
seem like this, all the lights are coming from a center point just above the clouds, but in fact they're separating from 93 million miles in that illusion, you know. Another one of the heliocentric coincidences with their, their terminology to yeah, cover it moving, up. Moving on to the moon, I would say the moon is... is a, there's a lot of different theories within the flat earthers. I sort of hate that term, but I'll use it for ease of, ease of the listeners. The moon is a tough not to crack because what I found is the moon's phases it's doing its phases no matter what the earth or sun is doing and a lot of the time people say oh it's you know the moon's like that because of the shadow of the earth and I'll look in look at the sky and I'm like well no it's not the moon's just doing its thing and that's not the shadow of the earth you know and the moon's just doing its thing and I've got multiple examples of it not being to do with the sun not being to do you know they say it's the reflection of the sun's light <laughs> They're saying the right. curve is from yeah, the but... Earth. I mean, the moon, the moon is not how we are taught it is. I have an article coming out in about two, three weeks about the moon that's going to lay a lot of this out. Could you explain a little bit about the moon and what you wrote in your book, Eric? Something for the listeners. Yeah. So they say that uh, lunar eclipses are the Earth's shadow on the moon. And so they say what happens is that the sun, earth, and moon align in this perfect 180-degree syzygy uh, where they're just in a perfect alignment. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, and then, yeah, just perfectly you're watching the, the shadow cross the moon. Um, but th th it's been recorded, and it happens all the time, that the sun and the moon will be visible in the sky at, at any at some point on Earth from the same period of time while the eclipse is happening. So far from being 180 degrees from each other all lined up, they are very close to each other many times, and this phenomenon is still occurring. So it absolutely cannot be the Earth's There's shadow. There's also been sightings of uh, stars in front of the moon. And one of the ancient Islamic symbols is actually a star in front of the moon. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the the moon is not a solid uh, place like in the yeah. Apollo landing videos, where yeah, it's just like moon a moon desert moon, yeah. place. Yeah, that you could just <laughs> land on. You can see just just look at it, pay, pay attention, and it, it looks nothing like the Apollo <laughs> videos. It's a yes, light, right. and, no. and it's very it's when circular. Look, it doesn't look. In my spherical. research recently, and I haven't got around to doing the article of why mainstream science says the moon is bluey silver, the the answers they give us are so funny. I mean, they say it's the sun's reflection, but the moonlight does completely different things to plants. It does different things to the sea. Oh, it's still the sun's reflection. It's the same light. Well, it's silvery blue. I mean, I look up. It's, it's, this isn't yellow or white. It's silvery yeah, blue. Yeah, it does totally different things. If it was reflecting the sun's light, not only is it reflecting it, but it's transmuting it and somehow turning it into the exact opposite kind of light. So, like, yeah, uh, yeah the sun's light that dries foods and things and preserves them, whereas the moon's light spoils many many yeah. types of foods. Anyone and the, the sun like esoteric work mysticism or who works with the moon energy and works with the sun energy these are very different flavors yeah very different flavors and if we go through history we see the lunar cults this is a very different energy to the sun cults these are very different esoteric energies you know on that on that subtle level as well right and they're equal and opposite too which yeah. is a subtle part of this deception where they're making the male sun energy 400 times bigger female. and the female moon totally. energy yeah they gotta diminish yeah. that and you notice there was 12 men that landed on the moon apparently to 12 being a masculine number and uh, the men on the moon so it's them conquering the female yeah, as usual uh, woodcuts it's showing the balance between male and female conscious subconscious as the sun and the moon always shown as the same size I believe a lot of these alchemists knew about the flat earth and the model we live in. But this is a theory I cannot yet prove. Yeah, yeah you look at those alchemical paintings and pictures, and yeah, the sun and the moon are always the same size, and the, the whole picture is always representing uh, multifaceted forms of balance of yeah. the feminine, the masculine, sun, moon, day, night, good, evil. If you look at all the, the, the paintings, they're all about duality, and a lot of them even will show how we come from a singularity, and that's where the, the, the triangle uh, shape 
you know, metaphysically, spiritually, symbolically, can be seen as uh, the descent of man or the creation of the physical world, because God is a singularity, but this physical creation that we live in is clearly dualistic yeah. with the male, female, sun, moon, day, night, inhale, exhale thing we've got going on here. So the triangle with the I at the top can also be seen as the I am as uh, God is referred to as the I am, as well as the I am at the center point of all of our consciousness. Um, it's sure. one and the same. In the, the I in the Kabbalah, the I am is like the highest principle. I, 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 yeah. so people, some people pronounce it different ways, which means I am. I am that I am. It's like the highest resonance within the 40 Hebrew resonant words. This is like ancient stuff. Um, with the moon, right. I think we should move on because we could talk about the moon for hours. I want to talk a little bit about Polaris, the North Star, because some people say the Earth can't be flat because we've got the North Star, and in the Southern Hemisphere, there's a kind of loose Southern Pole Star. Now, from my point of view, there's like two, yeah, we're flat, and there's two like spinning circles in the sky. How would you look at this as well, Eric? Yeah, the. The Polaris is right over the, the top of the North Pole, and then in a dome shape, whether they're in a dome or not, we'll discuss later, uh, but in a dome shape, the stars all rotate eastward uh, every night, uh, as you can see. So, But depending on where you are on the flat Earth, you're only going to see a limited number of the stars, and the angle at which yeah. the rotation is happening that far away. is they're going like to be... They're self-illuminaries that just aren't that far away. Exactly. They're not light years yeah. away. That's another, uh, you know, pseudoscience term or Star Trek term that they've created. Well, Star Trek created. was created by uh, Gene Robbery, who was, who was a high-up Freemason. And you can look at Arthur exactly. C. Clarke, who was a very high-up Freemason, and a lot of his writings in the 50s actually came to be what we know as astrophysics. <laughs> you got it. It's science fiction. The whole thing, when you when you really break the whole flat yeah. earth down and you, you find out the evidence and what you've been believing and thinking was actual evidence, you realize that, yeah, you've, you've been totally indoctrinated into this Star Wars, Star Trek yeah. science fiction and have believed that it was real, you yeah. know, for as long as you've you know, came uh, up with been the idea looking at a glimpse. And a lot of things that are being used. But with, uh, I believe that the software Stellarium, I think it's called, you're sort of on a flat earth and you can see you can move your location around the earth and you can see the, the spirals in the sky around the north star and the sort of southern star now stellarium is sort of correct i don't know if you know that software. right yeah the the planetarium yeah it's like that. uh is it's that like a planetarium, planetarium dome this software is pretty much telling us how it is it's exactly just not exactly exactly and so gillian light years away <laughs> Right. Yeah. Those. If you go to those planetariums where you sit down, you're on a flat yeah. plane, and then there's a dome over you, and Polaris is at the high point of the dome, and everything's spinning around you, and the constellations are fixed, and the wandering stars wander around the the sun as it goes around, uh, and so that's just how it's it is yeah. in real life. Um, but they just tell us it's slightly different. But we still go to those. Uh, planetarium uh, yeah. exhibits and everything. And Before the astrologers that. freak out, the astrology model still fits that each bit of light in the sky still gives us a different energy and the different wandering stars, which people call planets, plane with a T thrown on, these still give us high <laughs> definition energy like Mars, a very red, very war determination energy, Jupiter, fortune, wealth. You know, these, these are lights in the sky giving us energy. Like the sun is a light giving us energy, making everything grow. The moon is a light in the sky giving us energy. These things are real. Because I've had people saying, well, that means astrology doesn't work. I'm like, no, on the contrary. It's just more <laughs> real. It's more like here's a light in the sky giving us energy. Absolutely. It's completely the opposite. Uh, you know, if, if we're just one of billions of planets spinning around the endless universe, then astrology doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make much sense that planets would have an effect on our consciousness. But if we're the, the plane of existence and these lights are spinning around us like this, or whatever they are, uh, are spinning around us like this, and the ancients for thousands of years all over the world had this complex science, of consciousness it was based on how everything was aligned when you were born and where you were born under this dome of the heavens and uh, it, and I mean I've done my own experiments with uh, my own birth charts and other people's charts and it's 
it's uncanny, you know. If, if all you've ever heard of astrology is horoscopes and the generalized crap that you read in the newspapers, yeah, absolutely, it's nonsense and it discredits the whole thing. J.P. Morgan, one of these elites, said that uh, millionaires don't use astrology, billionaires yeah, I've do. Used, uh, so these elites, they know a lot of making important meetings on certain dates to do with transits. This is really powerful stuff. They just don't want people knowing it. Exactly. It's like exactly. a mystic Meg in, in as like usual. This. Right. Um, right, and then they let's say, go back to yeah, Antarctica. Label it with a cult. Antarctica's all around, yeah. all around the outside. People will say, "Oh, well, you can fly across it," and well, you can't. You're not allowed to. You're not even allowed to go there. Uh, I phoned up Antarctica. There's like a there's like a tourist umbrella you have to go through, and I sort of said, "Oh, well, I've got loads of money. I've got boats in Hawaii and India, which I don't." And me and some friends were going to hack down to Antarctica and walk across it. And I got loads of emails off these people saying, no, you don't, no, you don't. Fill out your permits. You've got orange membership. And I'm just, Fill out this. Why are you coming? I got, like, totally hammered just for saying I'm coming to Antarctica. What I found is you're only allowed in through New Zealand, uh, South America at the bottom, and South Africa at the bottom. And they take you in. You see some penguins. You sleep somewhere cold, and they throw you back out, all for, like, $5,000. Now, it's totally locked down, and I did an article about it where I looked at the Treaty of Antarctica, which is some countries got together and locked it down. They've got a lot of science research going on there, and they just don't let anyone in. Now, where this also where this treaty meet, they have a big table that's shaped in a pyramid with the top cut off, <laughs> which is, you know, you can call me a conspiracy theorist, but there's, there's obviously something there. What would you like to add on the Antarctica rim model, Eric? Yeah, so Antarctica is not just the tiny ice continent on the bottom of the globe that it, it shows, but it is the case that no matter where you are on Earth, if you go southwards from there, you'll hit Antarctica. So if you imagine expanding that little uh, Antarctic continent on the bottom of the globe out to an ice rim all the way across uh, along around the Earth, rather, the North Pole being in the center, anywhere you go in a straight line, you will end up going to the ice wall. Yeah, and many uh, boats through, you know, since the 40s, 50s have talked about my instruments went crazy, there were ice walls for hundreds of miles, I got lost. There's so many of these stories. Yeah, and, and so they say that there's a South Pole somewhere, too, on part of that guided tour that you're talking about. They've got, they've got an arbitrary point along the Antarctic ice that they've put a red and white barbershop pole with a ball earth on top of it and claim that that's the South Pole. But they even admit that it's not the real South Pole because the real geomagnetic South Pole is constantly moving. So since it's constantly moving, you're never really going to be able to see it. But the, the reality is, is they can't have people going down there with a compass and checking to see it, if it really it is, is the South Pole. It's been clever last year. Prince Harry was down there, and he basically just made some filming. He was with Rupert and Tarquin and a few of his friends. And the story was, it was on all the mainstream news, Prince Harry in Antarctica oh, we had to go back, it was just too cold, I, my foot got blisters and frostbite. What the message to the subconscious is, it, it doesn't matter how rich you are, don't go there, it's too cold. They know that Prince Harry and a team of injured servicemen and women have been walking to the South Pole. Well, they've got there, they've completed the 200-mile Walking with the Wounded South Pole Challenge, that's its proper name. Uh, they've spent more than three weeks trekking through Antarctica, and this was what it sounded like at the moment when they arrived at the bottom of the world. Oh, it sounds quite restrained, doesn't it, after all that effort? Well, they spent 20 hours in a cold chamber. This was the prince and the other competitors who were with him uh, to prepare for the conditions that they were going to find down there. The expedition was supposed to be a race. You might remember it being billed that way before it started, but the weather became so bad as they went along that they scrapped the competitive side of things and just joined up as one big team instead. And this was how Harry reacted after completing the mission. Um, we're here, we made it. It's Friday the 13th. Um, we've had so many things go against us. We've had beautiful weather, but bad weather before, and bad terrain and injuries and stuff like that, but um, everyone's made it, all 12 of them, the whole group of 20, whatever it is, but the 12 wounded soldiers have made it. Um, 
couldn't have made it without everyone's help, especially back home, you know, the founders, uh, Ed and, 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 and Simon as well. But um, everyone is everyone is so happy. Everyone's touched the ball. We've all had photos. We've all had hugs, a few tears here and there. But um, all in all, um, mission success, basically. <laughs> If you're wondering about that ball that he was talking about, it's the, the ceremonial South Pole at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. It's, a, it's like a metal sphere on a red and white pole and it's partly surrounded by the flags of the signatories of the Antarctic Treaty. So it's lovely for a photo, but the problem with it is it's not, it's not the real South Pole. It's about... 300 metres away. So at the <laughs> so real you, South Pole, what is that? Is it, well, there's nothing. That's the thing. It's, you, you can't, so you, to do it properly, to cover all your bases, you have to do both. You have to do the picture with the ball and then you have to go and kind of hang around at the exact um, well, why don't they move longitude the ball to and latitude. Where the actual thing is? Well, that's a very sensible well, question. It's not one I can answer, <laughs> okay. but it's a very good point. Exactly. Same with the North Pole. The, the, all the footage you can see of the North Pole is nothing but a long sheet of ice and people with uh, icicles yeah. in their mustaches and beards huddled together. Also, you know, yeah. Also, with the Southern Hemisphere around the South Pole, if you want to fly from, say, Santiago, Chile, to Christchurch in New Zealand, or any of these sort of flights, you can't fly across the South Pole because they say it's too cold. Which is a bit strange because the Pacific cold. Ocean is kind of cold, yeah. and they fly over that. Now, <laughs> and when you fly from any of these cities to the, around the right at the bottom of the southern hemisphere, you can't do a direct flight. It's like two stopovers, go up to Dubai, go up to Bangkok, three stopovers, two stopovers, thirty hours, and I spent hours looking at these flights, and you just can't get a direct flight. Yeah, yeah, and when you look at them at, on the ball model or the Mercator projections, you're going at like right angles to each other, making these the weirdest trajectories. And then if you just put, map the same flights, all of them on a, the flat as a muscle right. map, straight on, pr pretty much, or at least the best uh, the best you could do as far as refueling yeah. uh, points now, and whatnot. I think we should move on to NASA. Obviously, this could be an hour chat on its own. Somehow, we got to cover NASA quickly. I mean, obviously. The moon landings didn't happen. They were Stanley Kubrick. He, he sort of told us in The Shining. NASA's a lot of a lot of astronauts have been killed who work for NASA. Very strangely, NASA was created pretty much by people within Project Paperclip, a declassified uh, post World War II CIA project, where they took Nazi scientists with into NASA. Uh, I don't believe anyone has actually ever been into space because all the footage we have is from NASA. And all of this is like, you know, CGI nonsense. Well, what would you have to say about NASA if we you were to sum it up in a few sentences, Eric? <laughs> People have made some good acronyms yeah. to sum up so, NASA. We've got a uh, never a straight yeah, answer. National Association of Space uh, Actors. <laughs> yeah, no, no astronauts <laughs> should apply. <laughs> I got a really good one. Uh, you know the space shuttle that used to go up a lot, you know, and they'd do, yeah, whoa, the shuttle, uh, <laughs> the space shuttle, this is really funny, but I think it just flew around, and when everyone went home, then it landed at some secret uh, runway <laughs> at night. I think you're under something, I think you're I under asked, something. I, yeah, I asked a scientist is. about the shuttle, how it docked with the space station, while it's 64,000 miles an hour around the sun, <laughs> while doing 3,000 miles an hour or so around the earth. And the scientist says to me, oh, it's clever computers controlling the thrusters. <laughs> I, I said, well, the Harrier jump jet uses clever computers, and it can't take off in a breeze without wobbling about. And the scientist said to me, no, no, NASA's got really clever computers that no one else knows around, knows about. <laughs> I mean, I believe it. I, I believe think it. The, the footage on Moonraker, the old James Bond film, in the 80s of all the space shuttles i think that is better footage than nasa stuff yeah absolutely that new gravity movie <laughs> yeah. is pretty good i believe i believe george clooney's in space more than i believe buzz aldrin and neil armstrong i spent a whole night once searching for a re-entry movie because i thought well there's been like three three to five hundred space missions surely they filmed a re-entry couldn't find one they managed to find one of the space shuttle doing a re-entry and it's like it's so laughable it's total acting and they, they re-enter, it's like they're talking about, hey, is that orange out there? No, it's red. And they're moving their heads around and talking. But they're going about 3,000 miles an hour. And they should be like, you know, their heads should be coming off their bodies. <laughs> and then when they come
up into the atmosphere. It's pitch black and it says, hello, Houston, it's nighttime here. Just conveniently nighttime. So you can't see anything. <laughs> Why do people believe this stuff? And you did a video on the space station, which was really good, really summed up the space station hoax. Yeah, the, the astronauts, the whole thing they're doing there is they've, they've got these ways to convince us that they're floating, and that pretty much, that's what does it. We think that there's uh, an ability to go up, up, up eventually in space, and there's no pull back to the Earth. You don't fall back down. You just pop out into the <laughs> vacuum of gravity of space where you can just float out forever. So obviously this doesn't happen, but they're able to make us believe it does uh, with camera and tricks. I think so you use the, Hollywood has been doing this over the years as well. It backs up the theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hollywood uses all the same methods. They just <laughs> acknowledge that it's that it's fiction. Yeah. Yeah. So they use zero G planes for some of the footage when they're in the ISS. There, um, these, these zero G planes they do parabolic maneuvers, and when they're at a certain point in the parabolic, yeah. you're at a free fall state for up so to a minute. Right. Exactly. So uh, it can appear that you're in a zero-g atmosphere like that, and then you splice these together, uh, and you can do this for as long as you want. When they need to do it for a longer period of time, they'll usually just wear harnesses in front of a green screen, and that way they can do their long interviews and that kind of thing. And then for the outside shots, they do it in a There's dark been bubbles, pool. There's bubbles, isn't there, inside, uh, the, the model. inside the astronaut helmet? I've seen bubbles. Because they're doing it underwater. Incessantly, like every single time. They can't, they can't get footage without bubbles. It must be pretty difficult when you're in a pool to try and not have bubbles when you're bumping into stuff. And everything. People, I hate this word, sort of the, the big names. They, they, they don't believe the banks, they don't believe the politicians, they don't believe the gurus. They're questioning everyone and everything, except for NASA. It's like, hey, I'm, I've got this big truth website and all these DVDs, and I stand up on stage and talk about truth. But, but NASA, NASA's, NASA's correct. Well, it's just really fucking crazy <laughs> how everyone's questioning everything except for NASA. Yeah, how did NASA get that uh, control? What, what did they have that's so special? Is it stuff. sci fi? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they got a hold of the, the science fiction geek uh, demographic, the atheist, I think that's part of it too, kind of the atheist or agnostic, I don't know what to believe type people. NASA gives you an option. It's like, check out these Photoshop galaxies we made, believe in this. And everyone's like, beautiful, amazing, the, the universe is so amazing. You know, I, I think they... They look at these pictures of far-off galaxies, and and this they use their imagination to think of infinite yeah. worlds. And in, oh, in this world, it's exactly how I want it. There's this one planet, and on this one planet, everything's just how I want it. And they, so they they're holding on to some sort of belief that uh, an infinite space coming in from a big bang, non-god, uh, is, is more appetizing to them. So they have like a a philosophic metaphysic. Yeah. Uh, this is very much to the flat earth thing. Oh, we were so atheistic. We're going to get some chips in our heads and put our mind in a computer, and we're going to send it to space <laughs> and conquer the planets. Oh, people must be right, laughing. Right. There are people somewhere laughing. It's all, it's so all the ones, I think I'm one of them. <laughs> uh, let's move on a bit from NASA because we could do a whole chat. As I said at the start, I just want to do bite size. Uh, Google Earth. People say, yeah, but Google Earth, you know, it's got it's satellite pictures. Obviously. If you study Google, they own a fleet of planes. They're doing high-altitude camera shots. W would you agree with that, Eric? Absolutely, yeah. It wouldn't make much sense to use satellites from supposedly hundreds of miles yeah, of away course. to do these shots yeah. if you're yeah, we can, we can trying to take them. Yeah, we can do them 500 miles away, but no, you might as well take them from really close. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and people have won. It's really stupid. I don't get it. I don't, I, I don't get it. I guess just because they see that they model it on a globe, that they assume that it must have when you come that way pre-packaged. So <laughs> when you go to it for the first time, you see the Earth. That's not a photo. I mean, you don't have to be Einstein. That, that's not a photo. That's computer generated. <laughs> and you have to say to yourself, right. well, if they've been going to right. space since the 50s, 60s, why in 50 years haven't they taken a fucking photo or a video of the spinning Earth? What? Right, right. And they have. 
supposedly, but all the ones you see are so laughably computer generated uh, that you can't take them seriously, and and they know that, so they'll they'll tell you, well, it is genuine. It's just the way that we receive imagery from these special satellites is that we have to run it through Photoshop for us first, so that we can blend in all the ribbons of imagery that we're getting. Yeah, they've got, they've got prepackaged explanations for why it's from Photoshop. Yeah, I, I did an yeah. last week about the picture of the Earth they use. And I've got big questions about it. There's yeah, the no one picture the they had. It's totally photoshopped. Mm -hmm. Greenland's border, the light, the sunlight. It's just, there's no stars in it. I mean, there's hundreds of things. And people are, this is in encyclopedias, it's in school yeah. rooms, it's on New Age websites. Oh, I've got the world in my hands. Imagine peace on this globe. I, I'm just, uh, it's <laughs> everywhere, this picture. You can't get away from it. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about satellites. Yeah. Now, the first thing I think about satellites is, you know, you say it to people at night, say, oh, look, there's a satellite in the sky. Look, you can see it. Now, satellites are the size of a car, maybe a phone box, maybe some of the size of a bus. That's what they tell you. Now, you wouldn't be able to see that if that was 120 to 220 miles away. Your, your eyes aren't that good. I hate, hate to tell you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you never knew exactly. the doctor ever told you. <laughs> your, car, your eyes can't see a car 120 miles away. Your eyes aren't that good. Yeah. And your telescope's not that good either. Right. Your telescope's not even that good. Even your telescope would just see reflected light, right? And that's all they're seeing is some light, and they're assuming that yeah. it's coming from a satellite. It's a high altitude um, yeah, it, uh, flying thing, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's something flying up there. It's, it's not something orbiting in the uh, atmosphere. This is, again, this is the illusion. The satellites cannot exist because nothing can just stay up there unassisted. Everything, you know, what goes up must come down. That saying exists for a reason. Uh, there is no point that you could launch a satellite up and then it just stays there floating, hovering in the, the outer atmosphere, whatever they want it to do like that. There is no point where that happens and it wouldn't make sense for there to be a point where that happens because how, could, as we said, how could you go from the gravity uh, pulling you all the way back to Earth and then somewhere there's this finite stopping point. This, you know, could you imagine this like invisible area that you could just barely cross? You, you put a finger across it and your finger falls down. Down to Earth. Oh, 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 shit! Put your finger down. Don't put your whole hand. Because of gravity, they're slowly falling back to Earth. I said, well, the way they launch out of our atmosphere must <laughs> be really, they could be really accurate. He said, yeah, they're using really clever computers. I said, but what if there's a gust of wind? How can the computer compensate for that? Oh, it's so clever. It's, these computers are so clever. Because <laughs> obviously, if you put it in space, with some of the more recent uh, satellites. Out, it would just fly away from the Earth forever. So what they're saying is they're going sure. out at a certain angle where it doesn't fly away from the Earth and it doesn't fall back to Earth. <laughs> oh, 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 it's just really fun. To <laughs> it's like the magic angle that the uh, the rockets all go at. None of them go straight up. They all start a parabola, yeah. and the ones they claim are successful are the ones that go out of your view before they come back down, fall back down the rest of the parabola. A lot of them explode before they complete the parabola. But as long as it explodes out of yeah. your eyesight, it's good. If anyone wants to, I did some recent articles about Pluto. They're doing a big mission to Pluto, which is really funny. It's like under five is my first computer images. And I did an article about the Mars hoax. No one's ever been to Mars, the rover, and all this nonsense. You, you've really got to look into this, especially I mean, the high fives in Houston and these actors, these front men, the media front men, and that's <laughs> yeah, but... so funny. <laughs> What is that one guy, the, the guy that's in charge of the Mars thing, with the Elvis, the Elvis haircut and the non-answer for everything, looking in the crowd? There's a guy in the crowd that knows yes. the answer. Oh, he's not there. No, there's another guy in the crowd that knows. Uh, oh. oh, man, yeah. There's a, a movie out there called yeah, Mars Hoax. Good. I think that's what they, they called it. Yeah, yeah, check that out. Just to look at the acting that yeah, these NASA figureheads are, are doing. You can tell that they're actors. Yeah, they're not they're not scientists. They're they're poor actors. <laughs> secretly 
have felt that I do not deserve to be in the position of leading the team that I lead because they are certainly in some and largely by count of individual more capable than I. And I, I think that this nation is a truly great representation of a, of a corner or a piece of humanity that reaches out and explores and conquers and engineers. We are kind of tool makers, agriculturalists, pioneers, and, and that's reflected in the activities and actions and results of tonight. So I want to say thank you to the blue shirts. <laughs> Uh, certainly, this beautiful theater of tonight, the drama of us all being able to experience it together, unrivaled in the experience for all of us. And with that, really, I have nothing more to say. That picture says it all for me. I think that is the best picture of Mars I've ever seen. <laughs> the money, two and a half billion dollars, we don't put it in the rover and send it to Mars. We spend it here on Earth. And Charles mentioned at the beginning that this whole enterprise, if you divide it by every woman, child, man in this country, comes out to be the cost of the movie. I know I speak on behalf of all my colleagues in science. That's a movie I want to see. So thank you all. Tell us about the landing. <laughs> All right, Greg. Um, I can't tell you too much about it. I mean, it looks good. Uh, I'm being a little flip. Uh, in short, it looked extremely clean. Uh, we had... Uh, yeah. We had... Uh, we, had, we touched down in conditions that were um, on the more benign side of our nominal expectation. Our, um, the, by, by the way, I want to preface everything. This is preliminary data scooped with the sieve in the cacophony of the control, control room <laughs> during the celebration, right? And largely by my good friend Miguel San Martin, who's somewhere out there. I hope. At any rate, um, very nominal, uh, remarkably good. Uh, um, our navigation error was, uh, was on the low side of our expectation, which meant that we probably had a good alignment between the celestial center sensors and the inertial, uh, inertial sensors, the IMU. Um, our powered flight appears to have been excellent. If my good friend Ben Toma is in the house, is Ben in the house? So uh, it looked good, in short. Good and clean. And, and it looks, at least by my eyeball, that we uh, landed in a nice, flat spot. Beautiful. <laughs> really beautiful. What? <laughs> I have to ask you, what kind of file type, can you tell us about the image file type and compression that was used to send this very important uh, couple of thumbnails back from Mars? Yes, unfortunately, I absolutely cannot. <laughs> <laughs> if Justin Mackey is in the room, or there's a couple other people on the team who'd be able to whip that out quickly, but I, I don't, couldn't tell you. Sorry. Are you going to call your daughter Curiosity? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, a serious question. A little more than 48 hours ago, you told me you would tell me a secret. Once Curiosity landed. Can I have my secret? Yeah, what was this? A lot has happened in the last 48 hours. And to be very truthful, I do not recall what that secret was. 
for the landing that go down to something like five decimal points. Um, I just wanted to confirm with you that, that, those, those, that you do have them, have those sort of coordinates. And am I reading those coordinates correctly when I see that it looks as though you've landed within 500 meters of the uh, skirt around the mountain? That, I mean, you're really very close to the mountain at the closer end in the landing ellipse and possibly within striking distance of the phyllosilicate trench. I, can, I can't confirm that. Um, my estimate, I'm looking for somebody, yes, there's somebody in the audience here who has that in the tip of their noggin. <laughs> looking at the picture uh, and trying to figure out from there where we are, I would imagine by tomorrow, tomorrow's press conferences, they should have a better idea where, where it came down within a few hundred meters at least, hopefully. Okay, the next question's over on this side was when Adam asked for OD-278, and they said, no, we only have 277. What was happening, or was it anything of significance? N no. <laughs> <laughs> and what the bargain that we got this mission for? This movie costed you less than seven bucks per American citizen. And look at the excitement that we have brought and the inspiration that we have brought. And also, if you look online about how they send the images back from Mars or deep space, there's no, they, they, no one can tell you. No one can tell you how they send these images back. My friend said, my scientist friend said, it's radio waves. They do it by radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, apparently they're a million miles away sending pictures from this new Rosetta <laughs> comet or whatever. So we've, we've got some amazing technology that could go over a million miles. So for all those of you who think that uh, radio technology or whatever can't be sent over a flat earth, apparently it can be sent over a million miles. So they can be sent wherever they want to. These guys, NASA, yeah. are so far ahead of us. Of course, you can't question GPS that. GPS is all a big, uh, you it's, can't a, it's question a military that, project, so. wasn't it? GPS. Yeah, started by yeah. the U.S. Department of Defense. So right there, that act. I can't trust the coordinates when they go up to the North Pole, and none of them on any of the videos you can find in the public sphere, sphere uh, can you find them break out a compass and prove that they're at the North Pole. All they ever do is break out a garment that says North, and they all clap, we're here, good job. So there's, there's no actual proof, as far as I'm concerned, that we've ever seen a picture of the North Pole. Um, I'm very suspicious of what they claim to be the North Pole, just some random sheet of ice, and then they're almost there, three, two, one, we're here. Oh. That's it, like an hour-long documentary yeah. of ice and cold people yeah. being bored and boring so that you don't think that there's yeah. anything there worth, you know, worth your time. He's got quite top. a bit of money. He's like, and I'm going to Antarctica. And he spent, like, thousands, and they put him by some ice, sort of fed some penguins, slept in a cold igloo, then they kicked him off, took some photos. It's like, it's amazing. It's like, yeah? It's like, yeah, it was cold and there was ice. I'm like, I got that in my fridge. I got that in my freezer. You know? <laughs> and he spent, they, they charge you thousands. <laughs> it's crazy. So recently, Eric, you ousted the Flat Earth Society, which is a group that's been going for quite a while. You ousted them as controlled opposition, which I commend you for because some of their beliefs within the model I think are very warped and sending people the wrong way. Would you, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, um, the Flat Earth Society was this organization that was created in 1970 by Leo Ferrari, who was this guy that never took the Flat Earth very seriously and the people within the organization would often question whether he actually believed the Earth was flat at all. Um, so, he, for, you know, for instance, he would take a rock to all of his TV interviews, this big rock the size of a pumpkin, and he would say that he's just come back from the edge of the earth, and he would descri describe this adventure where he lost his ship and all of his crewmen, and he was just about to fall off the edge as well, but he hung on to this rock, and it was this rock that saved him, and he brought it back to show everyone. And so he'd, he'd approach the flat earth subject with this kind of satire, uh, though he'd also throw in some real flat earth arguments, you know, and he'd, he'd talk about how, you know, well, you can see with your senses that the earth is not moving and that the horizon's always flat. And so he'd mix in a few uh, genuine flat earth arguments and then nonsense. meanwhile, tr yeah, with nonsense. And so the, the current flat earth society, one of their 
uh, claims that they make is that gravity is real, it does exist, right. which, again... Yeah. The flat Earth is rising up nine meters a second or something. Exactly, so they, they give <laughs> this false argument for gravity, saying that the Earth is actually constantly rising up, and that's why, why the effect of gravity is seen, but it's really just the Earth rising up. So an argument like this is easily proven fault just by sustained flight, you know, if that was actually happening, uh, the Earth would crash into all planes and uh, yeah. power balloons and helicopters and everything. So by presenting a argument that's so easily proven false and ridiculous and mixing it in with other flat Earth information, which is legit, then it they, they just... the wrong way. Sure. It's but the I, tactic I, they do on everything. They mix truth with lies and smoke and mirrors and you end up down a pit. You know, they, they threw me off. They threw me off the trail for a year or more when I first started questioning the flat Earth. Of course, you Google it, and Flat Earth Basically. Society comes yeah. up for the first several, uh, you know, whatever you, you exactly. So yeah, we have questions uh, like, oh, Polaris. What about Polaris in a flat Earth model? <laughs> Within this model, it's always the Flat Earth Society forums that come up, and when you go in there, the answers push you the wrong way. It's very yeah. clever. Exactly, exactly. And I read their frequently asked questions that had this gravity explanation, and that, more than anything else, was what made me go, nope, forget that, there's nothing here, nothing to see here, you know, see, yeah. move on, move on, and that's um, the effect they want you to have, that they want to have. There's another guy who's been doing quite a bit of work on Flat Earth recently, uh, Mark Sargent, he did, he's done the Flat Earth Clues series, which have gone quite viral, I think. Uh, you asked him as a shill last week. Would, would you like to go into that a little bit, Eric? Sure. Um, he, I, I don't know if he is paid to do what he's doing, uh, but he's certainly spreading disinformation and doing it in such an effective way that I'd be amazed if he didn't have a paid operation behind him. Uh, I mean, I'm doing everything I can to promote uh, this this idea with my boards, and my articles, and my book, and my videos. And I'm really diligent, but I'm a one-man operation. And somehow, this guy has come out of nowhere by himself, apparently. And he's he, his workload is literally twice mine. The, the number of interviews he's doing, videos he's putting out. When he first came out with his Flat Earth Clues, he, was, he had one video a day, you know, That's well edited, time. high quality, sure, yeah. and, and now he's coming out with these long interviews with these radio people I've never heard of just day after day, and he's pounding the same points over and over again. He's mixing in a few, the same thing I just told you about the Flat Earth Society, he's mixing in a few good Flat Earth points, but then throwing in this litany of speculation and theorizing and anything but factual evidence, which is what we need at this point so that people understand as the is, as he, as I think a lot of his work's really good. Does that not mean he has given himself the platform to then theorize on some of his unknowns. Is he clear when he says, okay, the, this is now I'm speculating, now I'm theorizing? I wish he would be more clear about that, because like he'll say, the, the moon, uh, stars, and planets are definitely not there. They are projections, they are holograms. So he'll make claims like this, and then state them over and over again, interview after interview. You know, he'll have a great interview, and then he'll send you to that Crow 77 whatever disinfo channel to have you uh, thinking that everything's a hologram. And, and I, I questioned him about this. a holistic pit, don't you? into nihilism, oh, nothing's real, it's all an illusion. Sure. I, I, I questioned him about this, and I gave him all the evidence that the sun and moon are their own, uh, shine with their own unique light, and, and how, like we were talking about earlier, that the, the moon is clearly a natural light in the sky, but he's saying it doesn't exist, it's not there, it's projected, it's a hologram. This is just one of the many disinfo points that Mark is putting okay, into his video. He's saying this isn't a theory or speculation, he's saying this is fact. Well, this is the thing, when I presented to him all of the evidence counter, counter to it, he responded to me on, on the forum, you can read it, and he said, of course I don't have any evidence that the moon is a hologram. And, and he couldn't dispute what I was he saying. Prove it. Wait, if he's online talking about that, he should really say, I'm now speculating. 
Exactly. It's fine if he wants to speculate uh, and, and you know, wonder about the things that Crow is uh, filming. I wonder about it, too. What is that line he's filming? Is that uh, in, in just in his video program? You know, what, what's going on? That's fine, as long as you're speculating. But he's not. He's, he's stating it as fact. And then when I ask him for the evidence, he said, of course, I have no evidence, but then so continue see. stating it as fact. Oh, I'd like to welcome my guest, Mark Sargent. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> so how did this come into to your awareness? This came out into my awareness out of sheer boredom. <laughs> okay. uh, it was proposed, you know, by, you know, Cop Copernicus and others okay. that, uh, you know, using some, some very, you know, leap of faith math, you know, projections, uh, you know, saying, yeah, if this is spinning at a thousand miles an hour and going through space at 60,000 miles an hour, then yeah, you can, you know, you can build a solar system and that's, you know, what our world looks like. And that stuck because, you know, why not? You know, you know, it's like, it's like, but once they jumped on board and people, cause actually, you know, from an image point of view, this is pretty cool. No, no, no question. It's, it's a lot cooler than a disc. You can, you know, it's, it's spherical. People completely identify it. You know, with the with the whole you know, spherical thing. You know, what I initially did because I, I came from a, a computer game design background. I, I initially went in saying, "Okay, I, I still don't buy it. I'm still not on board completely." But I'll, you know, I will. What I'll do is I will try to create the design of the flat model, the enclosed world. And if I get to any point in that where something just does not jive, I'm just going to abandon the whole thing and say it's crap. And, and people, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't listen to this ever again. How do we explain the movement of the sun across the sky and the equinox, solis, solis, solstices, seasons, and tides? Got it, got it, got it. I'll lump it all up in one thing. Okay. Uh, stars, planets, sun, moon. Okay, we'll, we'll break it in two sections real quick. Stars and the planets, they are projected. They are not there they are a beautiful beautiful image you can look at them i encourage people to go out and stare at the stars they're great the moon is being projected on i do not know what the moon is and a lot of people don't either the sun appears to be a projection system of its own how far away it could be as far as i know a light bulb in a cage I hate to say <laughs> it. if the earth is flat then where does the heat come from ah, the sun good, even one. Hot? good one uh you mean the heat from oh most of the temperature is underneath. You know, you can control it. You know, it's all, all the temperature mechanisms are going to be below us. Yeah, the sun's going to give off some, seat, some heat, obviously, but no more than, you know, uh, you know a big light bulb in a, uh, I know it sounds cheesy, but a big light bulb in a big area like a terrarium. Uh, you can do so much more below than you can above. Uh, so the short answer to that, as far as where does the heat come from, uh, I think mostly below with the system. That's how I would do it. You got it. Again, it's tough to get your head around, but if you're building an enclosed system that's 8,000 miles across, what can't you do? You know, people are saying, oh, well, how do you do this? Are you kidding? <laughs> if you built the actual structure, the, the things you can do, you know, think of the things we can do now. I'm gonna multiply that by 100,000, and that's really what you got here. So, yeah. Yeah. Um Okay, why on different parts? So that would be the seasons, I guess. Why on different parts of the planet warmer than others? Uh, same, same sort of thing. Uh, the systems, if everything's based on temperature, uh, it's kind of like when people ask me about gravity. It's like, look, in, a, in an enclosed system, because an enclosed system is so much easier to maintain, you can make gravity any way you want, and you can make the temperature anywhere you want, anywhere. All you have to do is you make sure you sync it up with whatever's happening in the sky because people automatically, it's like, well, if the sun's in this part of the sky, it's going to be a colder time of the year. You just got to make sure that's consistent and everything's pretty good at that point. But uh, seasons, pff, seasons, just temperature. That's, that's a cakewalk. You, you don't even have to, you don't have to try that hard for seasons. Okay. Um, what about the satellite tracking app? <laughs> Is that, is that a fine well, no, 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 I, I got you. Uh, what about it? And the tides and everything of due to a different cause? Uh, tides, tides, do, tides are not affected by the moon. It can't be. Not if, not if it's, even if it's a three-dimensional object, it, it wouldn't, it's not big enough to do it. 
uh, it's all controlled below, not necessarily by the temperature, but by some sort of gravity system using probably, I don't know, molecular magnetism of some kind. Something easy. Something that could be done. It's been awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I see the flat earth meme as something that's going to grow. I'm not sure how fast, whether it's a snowball effect, but I do see it growing. And obviously as it grows, there's going to be more uh, division, separation, split, uh, trolls, shills, and things put in. Is that is that how you see the near future of the flat earth meme? Eric? Absolutely. Getting Absolutely. very okay. messy. What is the thing, the three stages of truth, they, they like ignore, ridicule, and then accept it. So they, they try to ignore as long as they can. They, they've put in the Flat Earth Society to honeypot any potentials that get through the, the net of disinformation and, and get onto the Flat Earth uh, subject. Um, but that's been enough up until now. And I think now that, that this is really getting out there, they're going to have to start, as they, as they do, mixing in uh, flat Earth truth with a bunch of diversions and uh, techniques to get you off of it and to try and discredit it from the inside, uh, and I think that's that's what we're seeing here, and I think yeah. we'll see it more and more with uh, Mark and other people as time goes on. I'll give Mark the benefit of the doubt, you know. I, I'll give Mark the benefit of the doubt, but I think if people are theorizing and speculating, they've got to be clear, and, or else things can get messy. Yeah. Uh, I want to say is there's obviously a lot of listeners thinking okay this is kind of crazy I've got things to look at and research to debunk this nonsense and ultimately thinking but why would they do this why would they go to all this trouble with NASA and the government and schools why would they do this and I don't know if you agree with me here but what I say, I would say to this is obviously it's very different if you're at the center of the universe and there's this intelligent design creation all around the humans. It's a bit more special than being on this random, come from a monkey, big bang, edge of a galaxy, in one of 300 million galaxies, on one planet where there's millions and billions of planets pretty the same. It's much more sacred and it's much more, much more empowering and it makes life so much more important to what you're actually doing here than being this random sort of ape-like creature. Is that, and I think they're trying to depower us with this. Is that one reason you would agree with, Eric, why they're doing this? Absolutely. That's a great explanation of it. Um, yeah, it, it spiritually controls us yeah. uh, by convincing us of a nihilistic, atheistic metaphysics, and we think that there's a science that backs it up. So, yeah. like they're saying, these, these people who are so yeah. brainwashed into the heliocentric ball-earth model, you're like wondering why they cling to the science fiction so much. It's because it's a well it's a holistic model of bullshit. They get, they're attacking yeah. from all different angles. Yeah. They've got this pseudoscience angle the and the Darwin. metaphysical angle. Yeah, the Darwin evolution angle and the Big Bang and dinosaurs and everything. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm just talking about <laughs> Yeah. Uh, one thing I looked at, and I'm sort of working with someone else on this, is obviously when I came around after a few hundred hours of, okay, we live on a flat earth, and laughing my head off for a week, thinking, how the hell can I talk to anyone about this? Uh, I thought, better than talking to people about it, I'll just do more research. And I started looking into ancient texts. I know, I know you've looked into this before, because you start to read ancient texts with new eyes within the Flat Earth model, and all the ancient texts give you a different read. This is all around the world, Norse, Maya, Genesis, the East, and anywhere on the planet, you pick up some ancient texts and you look at myth, or cataclysm stories, everything looks really different. Um, I looked into the center of the galaxy, what they call the center of the galaxy. It's like a rift in the sky. Now, obviously, this isn't the center of the galaxy anymore. This is a uh, sort of what looks like on a clear night, a sewn up rift in the sky. And I found about 50 to 100 references to this in ancient texts of being linked to a new sun or and or a cataclysm i don't know if you came across this information eric and what what your thoughts might be on this and of course i am speculating and theorizing i want to make that clear what yeah yeah I've, I've come across 
some of this, uh, but mostly from your work. So uh, as far as this subject is concerned, I was more interested in uh, hearing uh, more from, from you about. Um, I, I think it's absolutely possibility and uh, the research I've done into Atlantis and the worldwide flood and everything, uh, I think there absolutely were and probably are cataclysms uh, regularly here. So yes. something like this idea is not at all far-fetched, though it is quite scary. Yeah. Uh, I would say if anyone's interested in this subject, uh, who is slowly leaning towards the flat Earth model, Obviously, the galactic center doesn't really exist. It's more of a rift in the sky. And if anyone wants to look at this article, it's called Flat Earth, Galactic Center, and Ancient Myth on wakeywakey.com. There will be a part two coming soon, which is uh, something I'm working on with someone else who is spending a lot of time on this. And it paints a very interesting picture because when you look at the Flat Earth model and ancient text, everything just everything gets read in a different way. I know Graham Hancock's doing a lot of work now on a cataclysms and ancient texts, but he's on a ball earth model. He's talking about aliens in the solar system. It's just it's just nonsense. And I used to like Graham Hancock's work, but he's just he's just I don't know, too much jungle juice, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. It's just gone down the wrong way. And what I found with a lot of these big hotshot truthers, you, you try and talk to them about the flat earth and they just shut the door on you straight away. I don't know why that is. These are people who have yeah. been talking about being open to information for years, and they're just shutting the door. I'm a bit right. confused. Uh, what would you say about people like, I don't know if you've come across people like Thomas Sheridan, uh, who's been some of his associate stroke friends who've been attacking and insulting anyone speaking about or leaning towards the flat earth model. What would you say to high profile people like that? Yeah, that's an interesting one too, isn't it, Thomas Sheridan? Um, yeah, he's been making videos about you know anti-flat Earth videos, <laughs> saying that everyone who's coming out with a flat Earth uh, thing is is disinfo, CIA disinfo. I think he mentioned me my name at one point, so apparently I'm <laughs> CIA. He's a bit anti-flat belly, isn't he? As well, <laughs> well, I noticed that. I noticed that. David Icke and Alex Jones—they got these, they got these Mason bellies or whatever you want to call anti -flat them. Anti-flat belly. <laughs> yeah, they're globularists. Icke's well. Icke's been on the on the pies, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is that? I, I'm a bit confused with this because I see a lot of disdain in some people. It's like I'm going to spend three hours of my life attacking Russell Brand. Yeah, he's a bit of a shill, but three hours, I mean, there's a lot of disdain in one human. I'm going to attack people who've done ayahuasca, who've, you know, maybe had a rape trauma cured in one night, or cocaine addiction. I just feel that some people have a lot of disdain, and they're out there with showing off their disdain. I'm finding it a bit weird. Now, I'm happy to talk about curvature, or Horizon, or Antarctica, or NASA, but if someone just says, oh, flat earth's nonsense, it's kind of like unintelligent. You have to pick one of the sub-subjects and talk about it. Like, show right. me a satellite going to space. If 500 or 5,000 satellites are in space, show me a video of one going into space. You can't, because <laughs> none of them fucking have. You know? Well, so I'm well. happy for one of these guys to come and talk to me. I'll do it online with them. If they want to talk to me about the flat Earth, I will talk to these people. But I'm not just going to go, oh, flat Earth, you're an idiot. Oh, ball Earth, you're an idiot. You've got to talk about the actual nuts and bolts of the subject. You're not going to get that, though, with the kind of person who would want to debate you. That's the whole thing with debate. The idea is you both already know the truth, and you're just going to fling shit at each other until the end of the debate. Have you ever seen a debate where one side concedes, and he's like, you're right, we're done. Maybe we should just do like Taoist style. We should just get a sword and fight to the death, and whoever's <laughs> of his theory wins. <laughs> This could be called cool, like truth sword fights, truth debate sword <laughs> fights. I don't know. There's got to be a way to do it. <laughs> Maybe a market pie eating that. contests. <laughs> it's the most pies. Their theory wins. <laughs> oh, I should move on. But yeah, I, d I don't know why there's so much disdain out there. I think I don't know. I don't get it. I think people just think flat Earth. Oh, you fall off the edge, and they don't look any further. Of course, that's nonsense. 
Yeah, it's an easy target. They figure, well, I can make fun of these people as bad as I want to, and everyone's going to be on my side and agree with me, so let's just go for it. So the, I notice that's always the lowest common denominator of people that comment when I post things on Facebook or whatever. Uh, the intelligent people, they, they won't comment. They'll watch it, click like, move on, research something else. Yeah. A few weeks, few weeks later, they'll add me as a friend, private message me, say, you know... That, that kind of, and that's what a normal, uh, you know, free-thinking yeah, human does. The person, the kind of person that just reads the headline and then yeah. instantly comments within five minutes of you posting it. They obviously haven't read it or you know seen the video or whatever it is. They're just going on their uh, pre. Uh, conception of whatever, and then if you waste time debating with someone like that, there's no progress being had whatsoever. Totally. So it's better, yeah, it's, it's better to just recognize that there's some people who are worth talking to, and you can plant seeds and, and have discussions with, and then there's some people that you're better off just talking just about bother. something else, or yeah, yeah just don't, don't bother. That's why I made my monkey blog, because there's two scientists who just kept emailing me repeating what their physics teacher told them it was pointless. There are a few guys, like you say, who first like, oh, I used to like your website, Mark, but I think you've gone a bit crazy now. And then a few weeks later, send me, well, what about, what do you think about this and this? And then a few weeks later, come back to me and say, well, I was speaking to my brother about it, and, you know, maybe this is in this, but how do you look at the sun in this? And, like, they're slowly trying to piece things together. They don't believe it yet, but they're really 50-50. What I say to these 50-50 people, if, you're on, if you don't know what sort of reality construct you live in, you shouldn't go to work. You just should be top of your list. So if you're alive <laughs> and you don't know where you're alive, this is kind of important. Right? Like you were talking about the motive. There you go. It, it literally is the biggest thing you it's could possibly lie about. Going on. It's like, oh, no, I'm going to read my golf magazine today. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't care if the world's flat or round or what. I'm just going to go and play golf. This is kind right. of crazy. It's kind of crazy. It's kind of mental. It's like you need, you know, you need some help. That's what I think. You know, people can do what they want, but... And people think that we're believing in the flat Earth, but what they don't realize is that they're believing in things like gravity and satellites and the ball, spinning ball Earth, uh, and they believe it because they were taught supposed proofs uh, when they were really small children before they had the critical faculty to really examine it and find the counter evidence and everything. So they bought into it as, as a child. And then, as Mark Twain says, uh, it's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. So uh, you were easier to fool as a kid than it is to wake you up as an adult and have you re-examine with a clean slate what you thought you knew and see uh, where the evidence actually points. And you're going to find that you've been believing a model because you looked at globes, you saw NASA pictures, you used to believe the moon landing was real. Uh, you, you know, you've heard these things about circumnavigation and ships disappearing below the horizon and, and whatnot. You've heard these proofs in your textbooks and you haven't actually looked into them because your teacher never taught you the potential refutations. Your teacher never had you read flat earth books or geocentric books. They exist, teacher, but we don't get taught those in government yeah, yeah. schools. Well, so, well, a lot of people think they think it's creationism or rationalism. I've had a lot of people come to me like that, oh, you're a creationist. Wow. They're, they're defining, they're putting this into labels, into baskets, and I don't like definitions. I just like to know what's true. Right, how rational is everything coming from nothing for no reason and spontaneously creating order and life consciousness, intelligence and everything around us? That's very rational. It's, it's rational to think that that comes from nothing yeah. for no reason. And, and it's life. irrational to think that this creation had a creator, that this design was designed, right? And like in India, there's like two, three hundred mile long train tracks that, have, that are very straight, that have no technology for the curvature in the earth. Right. And, like each train track, each rail doesn't like curve like half a millimeter. It's like it's not possible. I mean, we That's don't right. Know Railroad all. tracks, canals. Canals, yeah. Yeah. There was a test done, wasn't there, in Cambridge in England, uh, 30 miles. There was like flags put in a straight canal and they used a telescope and there was no curvature. 
Right. I did many tests on the, the old Bedford level. It's called this really straight canal. Um, and yeah, they did a bunch of different experiments and every single one came out with no curvature whatsoever. So even if the curvature, uh, even if the ball earth was correct, but the ball was much bigger than they estimated, you'd still be able to calculate and see the curvature. Yeah. And it's just none whatsoever. Standing water say, is flat. They say, well, if it was flat and that was the case, I'll be able to see Everest. No, because of atmospheric haze. You just, you know, That's you right. You don't know there's atmospheric haze. That's right. You hear that one all the time. They say, if the Earth is flat, then I should be able to see London from New York. Um, and because they think that through their telescopes, they're seeing starlight from trillions of miles away. So they think that they can see that far uh, along the Earth. But first of all, you're looking horizontally instead of vertically at the densest level of the atmosphere, which is far from transparent. So if you picture the blurry haze over a road on hot, humid days, that's the same kind of uh, blurring out that happens as you zoom a telescope in long before you could see across the entire Atlantic. You would just blur out into a haze. So you know, But you can, however, through a telescope, return a ship which disappeared beyond the horizon into full view, yes. and you can... And you can see much further along the flat Earth than you could if it had the stated curvature. Yeah. So you can use telescopes to prove that the Earth is flat. They just can't see all the way across the Atlantic, like the trolls love to yeah. say on my YouTube videos every day. Yeah. Also, I put on some of my articles, there's a lot of symbolism around, like on Google, on Earth Day, and the films Dark City, The Truman Show. There's some other films I've listed. There's a lot of things around in symbolism telling us as well. Yeah, Things the like Game of Thrones ice wall they've got in that, that new Game yeah, of Thrones. Yeah. They've got the uh, Under the Dome Stephen King series where they're entrapped in a, in a dome. You got, like you said, the Truman Show, Dark City. Uh, yeah, there's quite a bit of Flat Earth references in movies and television shows as well. As well as like Obama always bringing it up in his speeches yeah. to ridicule it. Yeah. I don't have time for the Flat Earth Society. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. Yeah. Um, what would you say is actually happening, say, 20 or 200 miles into Antarctica and 100, 200 miles up? Would you say there's, this is where things get a bit grey for people? I personally don't know, but I speculate that there's possibly some sort of dome, possibly glass or something. Well, what, what are your views on this, Eric? And again, we're, I just want to make it clear we're in speculative territory here. Yeah, I, I, I keep this whole area in speculation mode because there is no real physical, tangible proof that you can point to to, to be sure uh, that there is or isn't a dome, a barrier, or an infinite plane uh, out there on the Antarctic ice. So I'm, I'm staying open to all possibilities, though I would say that the having an edge that you fall off into the nothingness of space, that doesn't really make much sense to me. So I, I doubt that's it. The infinite plane model does make a lot of sense, especially as you see the horizon does rise uh, all the way up. So it's got to be very, very far out there. I'd love to see an amateur balloon uh, rise in Antarctica yeah. and see what happens. Yeah, it's see if happen. there's some sort of... Yeah, shot. it's not. <laughs> some, some vessels have been shot down in Antarctica. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. It's very, don't want very militarized. To, Right, you're not going to get there except for their tourist photo ops. There's no way you're going to get through if you just think that you're going to go there as an explorer on a ship independently because a lot of guys have tried that and so far nobody has gotten through. So they, they do keep the Antarctic and the North Pole on lockdown. They don't let anyone through without approval. Yeah. And you've recently set up a forum, haven't you, Eric, which has got some interesting things on. I've actually been building an off-grid cabin recently, so I've been a bit too busy to be online, but could you explain a little bit about your the forum you've set up and what's going on there? Sure. So we mentioned the Flat Earth Society, which was started in 1970. In 1956, uh, the International Flat Earth Research Society was started by Samuel Shenton. He was a legitimate, genuine Flat Earth researcher. Um, none of these faults flat earth arguments with the earth constantly rising to account for gravity you know he didn't go on tv and bring on rocks that he supposedly held on to from the edge of the earth he stuck to real science real arguments um, and that's why they set up the flat earth society uh, to discredit him to to bring attention over to their satirical society instead of his and uh 
they actually, Charles Johnson took it over after Sam Shenton's death, and Charles Johnson had several attempts made on his life, which he swore came from NASA agents, and eventually they burned down his house and all of his flat earth material and correspondence, all, all the people that uh, he kept a correspondence with and that were in his flat earth society, uh, he had a newsletter and all these things, so that was all gone, um, and, and then the Alferraris Flat Earth Society was the only one in existence until this past month. I just decided I would, in the tradition of uh, Charles Johnson and Samuel Shenton, uh, strike up the International Flat Earth Research Society again in opposition to the Flat Earth Society, the satirical uh, society we were talking about with all their flat earth, false flat earth arguments and everything. Uh, so this board uh, is moderated by myself and I'm only allowing people who are genuinely interested in looking at the flat earth or our researchers themselves. I'm not allowing these trollish guys that just come in to bait, yeah, uh, you know, that's wise. right, but there's endless amount of these people on the other forum and that's the whole reason um, why people who go to their forum get completely turned off from the subject because they see that it's just a bunch of, you know, bored people. Uh, they're often talking about having a drink at late at night, so it's just this place for frat boys to go late at night and they want to talk shit on the internet, basically. That's what the Flat Earth Society is. But if you go to, to mine, it's the ifers.boards.net, I-F-E-R-S, uh, the International Flat Earth Research Society, and uh, there's a lot of great people. A lot of people have said they're intimidated by the level of IQ of people on the forum and that the forum is nothing like any, any other forum on the internet. So I hope to keep it that way. Um, but if you're, you're genuinely interested in Flat Earth, definitely come on over, check it out. I really recommend Eric's uh, book on the Flat Earth, and Eric's made some great videos uh, that are on YouTube that have gone quite viral. Uh, I'm not sure whether Eric or myself are going to get taken out first. Uh, who do you reckon, Eric? Me or you? <laughs> That'd be a joint hit, you know. We'll just, yeah, they got to find the us. SWAT we're team. We're both the SWAT team, all the flat earth guys. Yeah, SWAT one. team. They've got to find us, though. We're kind of like shadows, aren't we? In the middle of nowhere. That's right. So make it a bit, they have to spin a bit more petrol. They can't use satellites to find us because they don't fucking exist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny. Well, so, what I'd say to listeners, if you're interested in this subject, you've got some questions if you think it'd be kind of fun to research uh, eric's website is the atlantean conspiracy.org mine's wakey wakey.com sorry yours is the atlantean conspiracy.com yeah. sorry i'm wakey wakey.com and uh follow your nose from there what you do i'm just going to say one quote from a guy called france fanon before we wrap this up which is sometimes people hold a core belief that is very strong when they are presented with evidence that works against that belief, the new evidence cannot be accepted. It would create a feeling that is extremely uncomfortable, called cognitive dissonance. And because it is so important to protect the core belief, they will rationalise, ignore, and even deny anything that doesn't fit in with that core belief. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, that was great talking to you. Thanks for your time.
like you, uh, he's going to interview you. A monkey? Hello. All right, hello, monkey. Hello, I just said hello. So, Mr. Monkey, what is it you like doing? I like working for a boss, nine to five, in a job I don't like. And I like to watch TV. It's really good. And everything I know really come from my school teachers. Okay, Mr. Monkey. Sounds a bit, a bit weird. Your voice sounds a bit like mine. Shut up, Monkey, or you're going to ruin it. Also, I like spinning on a planet when it goes through space. Around the sun. In the big universe with galaxies and planets. NASA tell me that, and it's amazing. Hmm. Got a few issues with that, Mr. Monkey. Hmm? Yeah. Got a few questions for you. Hmm? You can't question stuff like that, because everyone knows that. The planet's round, spins around the sun. Yeah. Woo! Spinning! Alright, Monkey. So, why is the horizon always flat? and remains at eye level, even at high altitude. Like in a hot air balloon, one goes up and the horizon stays flat at eye level. Are you crazy? I've seen pictures from NASA, Photoshop pictures telling me different. Okay, another question. Why is there no feeling of the Earth's spin at all? Do I have to do this interview? It's crazy, I think I saw a hand around the back of my neck then. It's crazy. Okay. Why do constellations remain in constant relation to each other and have done for thousands of years? That's because, like, stars like Polaris are zillions of miles away. Can you prove that? No. But my teacher at school told me. Okay. Okay. Why were the Apollo moon landings faked? And all other NASA things faked. Are you crazy? I heard the moon landings. My granddad listened to it on the wireless, on the radio. Everyone knows it's true. The space race. We all paid lots of tax and got there before the Russians. You're crazy. Okay, Mr. Monkey. Why is there no video at all of the ball Earth spinning in space? Isn't there? When I go on YouTube, I look at... Things like Britney Spears, Millie Cyrus, Sport. There's got to be one on YouTube. No, there's not. You're crazy. Why is there no video of anything ever re-entering the atmosphere? There's one video of the space shuttle that's just a pure hoax. Hundreds of missions have re-entered the Earth from space. Loads of astronauts told us. Oh, there's a thumb! I saw one, there it was! Get off my neck! I'm not on your neck, monkey, you're going to ruin it. Carry on, come on. Stay with the program. Why are you not allowed to explore or even fly over the North or South Pole? If you're not a part of the team, the treaty. Who wants to go there anyway? It's cold! There's no monkeys there. Do you think I'm polar bear? Do I look white? Alright, monkey. Alright. Why do the sun and moon appear about the same size in the sky? One's 400 times bigger and 400 times further away. God, everyone knows that. The eclipse is pure coincidence. My physics teacher told me that. Yeah. He was clever. Because he went to teach training school and told me everything they told him. <laughs> right, why do long railways and roads, like in India, have no technology for the Earth's curvature, which should show some sort of curvature every 20 miles or so at least. Don't know. Hmm. Why can you not fly directly from South Africa to Australia? You have to go through the Middle East or Asia. I don't fly, I swing in trees. You must be wrong. No, I've spent hours on flight sites trying to fly directly and they make you stop off overnight and places anywhere around the southern hemisphere it's very strange you're a bit crazy right how am i gonna monkey how am i gonna press the laptop because it's timed out 
I'll do it. There we go. <laughs> okay. Why are there not thousands and thousands of pictures of Earth from all the satellites up there? Why do we have the same few graphically enhanced self-admitted composites from NASA all the time? Hubble's facing the other way. It doesn't turn around to face Earth ever. Hmm. It's a bit weird. Why are the photos of Earth perfectly round when they're supposed to be a, like bulge at the equator? Don't know. Why are you so resistant to the idea the Earth might not be spinning, not be a globe, and actually be the centre of the universe that is a lot smaller and closer than we've been led to believe? Does it feel like a religious view that you refuse to examine? How is this different to knowing about the New World Order and false flags, chemtrails, etc.? I want a banana! Television! Go to work! I don't need any of this! How can water be curved? Do you think the Pacific Ocean is a big bulging ball of water? And if so, can you show video or even a photo of water behaving this way? No! Nope. In the jungle I live, where's a river? That's all I know. Because I'm a monkey. Okay, monkey. My arm hurts now, so we'll wrap it up. Goodbye. Bye-bye! chat with Eric from the AtlanteanConspiracy.com. Uh, Eric and I have known of each other's work and had the odd chat over the years. And then a few months ago I saw he'd written a book about the flat earth model. I was I was embarrassed for him and got in touch with him to see if he was okay, if he was joking, gone crazy, or whether some psyops had got to him. And we had a kind of rational chat, and he sent me his book on the flat earth, and told me to have a look. Now, after some sniggering and laughter, I, I read it, and thought, hey, this is fun, I can debunk it in an evening or so. So I quite like researching and stuff. Now, 300, 400 hours later, after I did some deep investigation, research, and reviewing... All I, all I could really debunk was the NASA, physics, heliocentric, relativity, spin around the sun model, and very much agree with, lean towards the, the flat earth model. Since then, Eric's made a lot of YouTube movies that have gone viral, had a lot of, uh, a lot of people commenting on his website and on his Facebook, and Eric's done very well debunking them and rebunking research before you even start to really question it. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> to, to really be convinced of the, the evidence and the proofs for a flat earth and to debunk all of the supposed proofs and evidence you think you have for the spinning ball earth, you're going to have to put in some serious time researching these things yeah. so you can figure it out for you. Yeah, I mean, what I will say is that it's the spherical earth Heliocentric is a model, and it is a model that works. That doesn't mean it's true. You know, people can go sure. and study it, astrophysics it, it for five, well. ten years and be a great astrophysicist, but they're learning a model, they're learning a theory. It, it doesn't mean it's true just because it's in university. Uh, should we? I think we should start off, maybe, Eric. I mean, this will turn get loads more people to turn off straight away. But I'm not too fast about those people who aren't open to new information. Um, the actual model we're talking about here when we say flat earth, I mean, people automatically think, oh, well, you're going to fall off the edge, and, well, people have sailed and flown around the world. I think we should just maybe talk about the model. I mean, 
we, we, I think we both agree the North Pole's in the middle. There's a round, flat disc with Antarctica all around the outside. Is that something you agree with, Eric? Yep, that's the model. Yeah, so of course, poss of course people can't fall off the Earth because they hit Antarctica. And of course people can sail or fly around the Earth because they go around Europe, Africa, the Americas, around Australia, and back to where they started on this round disc, this circle. Now, obviously this is a bit of a long jump to get from a heliocentric school lesson to this model we're talking about. So maybe we could start with, uh, maybe if you could explain a few things on why we're not spinning and why we're not spinning around the sun. We sort of tear apart the heliocentric model a little bit. Sure. So the, the model that we're taught is not only are we spinning, the Earth is supposedly a ball that's spinning on its axis at over a thousand miles per hour, but it's also spiraling, uh, spinning around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour, while the sun is spinning around the Milky Way galaxy at uh, 600,000 miles per hour, and the Milky Way galaxy is shooting off from a big bang uh, creationary explosion 14 billion years ago at something like 670 million miles per hour. Yeah, that's a lot of genius. Something like that. That's a lot. That's a lot. But the magic of gravity and uh, science allows that to not be felt, seen, or heard by us in any way. So this, you know, this supposed thousand mile per hour eastward spin, uh, you can feel the slightest westward breeze, yeah. but not, not nothing from this uh, spin. And that, of course, the heliocentrists tell us, is because gra uh, the atmosphere magically sticks to the spinning ball yeah. Earth. Which is strange, spins because with it. the air one mile up would be traveling slower than the air, you know, 50 miles up, because there's further for it to go. I've spoken to some scientists about this, and they've been put in a corner and had some very strange replies. Uh, we can also look at the Red Bull skydive a few years ago. He went into outer space. Uh, it took him three hours to go up and then land. Obviously, if the Earth was spinning, he should have landed hundreds of miles away from where he took off. But he actually landed six, seven miles away from where he took off. This doesn't make sense. Right, right. Like you said, the higher up the atmosphere would go, it would have to be spinning faster because it's further away from the center yeah. of spin. And no one can and, explain this. Right. And they don't say how high up it goes. Yes. They, they don't tell you how high up the vacuum of space begins either. So apparently gravity and the atmosphere and everything has this effect and it's spinning gradually faster and faster the higher you go. So if you're sending a rocket up there, the rocket would be going through faster and faster yes. layers of spinning atmosphere until eventually somehow it pops, pops out, out into non-spinning non atmosphere. Yeah, I've been speaking what? to people about this, some scientists, and I've said, okay then, where is this, how many miles up does this stuffing a lot of scientists, the ooh, I'm intelligent, scientist male gangs, and this is kind of snowballing, so much so that some people in the I hate these words, truth movement, alternative websites, whatever labels you want to use. Some people are starting to do shows and articles with a lot of disdain towards anyone aligning or leaning towards the flat earth model. So I think, I think it's about time. Someone had a chat to Eric and someone had, you know, some people got some of this information out because it's not just the earth's flat. There's a lot of sub subjects. So, if you're new to this information, you're obviously laughing, it's all kind of funny, <laughs> fall off the edge, ha ha. But know this, for, for every answer you get, you're just going to spawn loads more questions because there are so many stones to unturn. So without putting lots of time in, it's just going to look laughable. There's no other way around it. There's no, no one's going to tell you the earth's flat. There's loads and loads of things you, one needs to look at to make this model look slightly palatable. So, without further ado, let's welcome Eric. If you could uh, lightly introduce yourself, your website, and a little bit about your journey through creating your Flat Earth Conspiracy book. 
Hey. Good to finally talk with you, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I started my AtlanteanConspiracy.com website like eight years ago when I was getting into 9-11 truth and uh, those New World Order, those kind of conspiracy topics that Alex Jones and David Icke always went on about. So they kind of got me into the whole conspiracy world. And then as I got into it further, they went from uh, heroes to anti-heroes for me. Yeah. And now I see them as killed opposition, kind of working for the man in one way or the other. Um, and so I, as far as the flat earth is concerned, I'd always had uh, some notes regarding the, the spinning ball earth as they taught us in school. Uh, I remember as a kid, they, they, you know, they raised in my hand and asking questions of the ball with it spinning around. Why doesn't everything fly off or fall off? And they'd explain gravity, and that, that just wasn't doing it for me. It didn't make much sense. But the way school is, is you've got to regurgitate their answers or else you, you fail. And you yeah. got to keep going until you do regurgitate their answers. So, Bullshit. all right, okay, whatever. It's a spinning ball, gravity, got it. Okay, yeah. I can put that down on a test. True, false, true, whatever you say. And uh, that's why I was school, always... Uh, at school, the things that go in between the age of 7 and 12 seem to go in re really deep. That's what I was oh, yeah. About. Absolutely, yeah. They, you get to them young, and you can keep them for life, right? Yeah. How did the actual book come about, Eric? What, what sort of information, what sort of things happened to enable you to think, wow, I'm going to collate all this and write a book about it? Uh, I started looking more into geocentricity, which is the idea that the Earth is stationary and the planet stars and the moon all revolve around us. And there's quite a lot of evidence there. So I deepened my Atlantean Conspiracy book. Uh, I didn't get into the flat earth, though I had already started reading a bit of f old flat earth material at the time. And over the, the past few years, uh, I've been reading a lot more. And once I'd read enough to be convinced of the conspiracy and have enough evidence to present my own arguments and represent the, the old arguments, uh, that's when I wrote my book. Yeah, great. Because as, as I said in the introduction, uh, I read your book and I was sort of laughing a little and tried to debunk it and after three, four hundred hours research I'm on board and with the flat earth model and it's quite simple-ish to debunk the heliocentric spherical earth model. And that's what I sort of want to go into today. I want us to, instead of saying, oh, we think the earth's flat, people will just turn off laughing, is actually look at all these little stones that one needs to unturn to sort of get towards, leaning towards some sort of questions towards it possibly being a flat earth. Because as you know and I know, it, it, there really is hundreds of hours of 